I'm going to ask that you take your hymnals and turn to hymn 208 and stand as we sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. have gathered in this place this morning to celebrate and to remember the life of Karen Stanford Shelton. Even though our hearts are sad and we grieve the loss of this mother and grandmother, sister and friend, we also rejoice this morning because we know that right now Karen is at home with her Heavenly Father. She has been reunited with Weldon, with her mom and dad, and what a joyous celebration and reunion has been going on all week long. Karen is finally home. We have gathered not only as we grieve the loss of Karen, but we give thanks to God this morning for her life on this earth and for her eternal life now with God. We celebrate Karen's life as we rejoice in the memories that we have of her and we praise God this day that her life of no pain, no illness, no trappings of this earth has now started with Jesus Christ in her new heavenly home. It is during times like this that we often look for comfort from scripture and often that we find that comfort in scripture. 
It is in the book of Psalms that we find encouragement and hope and that we also find words that are uplifting and joyous. So I have chosen two Psalms to read today. The first is Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter, with, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And then I chose Psalm 121 for the words of encouragement and hope. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Let us pray. Holy God, even before you formed us in our mother's womb, you knew us. Throughout our earthly lives, you have provided for us and you have guided us through this earthly journey. You have blessed us with family and friends to love and to share our lives with. But today we are filled with sadness and emptiness because we have lost someone that is very dear to us. We grieve because Karen will no longer be with us. She will no longer be physically present in our lives. But yet, even now, we put our trust in you. We ask for comfort for this family, for the peace that passes all understanding, and for your strength as they face the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who were close to mom or you know me, you must be aware that I wear my heart on my sleeve. This is a trait that mom and I share. I wanted to speak to my mother's beauty as seen through the eyes of her baby boy, but I was absolutely certain that I could not accomplish this standing here in front of everyone. I'm Karen Stanford Shelton's baby. I'm a mama's boy. This is terribly difficult for me to maintain all composure. I miss her so greatly that at this point, I cannot be relied on to speak a recognizable form of the English language. So on this particular day, this is how I can express my love and respect for my mother, Karen Stanford Shelton. Mom never wavered in her love for us. It is not an easy job to be a parent. I think that being the mother of two boys, about five years difference in age, is one of the more difficult parenting responsibilities. I'm not entirely convinced that John wanted me to come home from the hospital. <laughs> Mom had her hands full, no doubt. It could not have been easy establishing her art career dealing with two growing, bickering boys. Even so, she never once left us feeling neglected or for a moment withheld her love. As we grew older, and I was totally bugging the snot out of John, Mom certainly must have used paintbrushes, oils, canvases, and her imagination and natural skill sets to progress past those parenting challenges. 
One of those challenges that I posed to her when I was just a small boy may have actually altered the course of her art career and, and led her away from oil paints. Just ask me how turpentine tastes. <laughs> My childhood was filled with love, family, and fun times with mom and dad and all of our extended family and friends. I feel incredibly fortunate to have had the upbringing that mom, dad, and nearby grandparents provided the first chapters of my life. Mom always supported her sons in our artistic and creative pursuits. One of the loves of our lives is music. The music that filled our house was an absolute gift to me and continues to be so. John became a creative photographer, but not an artist with a paintbrush. I have long found a creative outlet with audio and video production and have had great experiences creatively without the command of the paintbrush. Mom's drawing and painting abilities have leaped a generation to take root in her grandchildren, Will, Aaron, Spencer. Her creative talent will continue to live on in these younger generations now and still to come. In that way, she was an inspirational lodestar to many. I grew up often seeing my mother within the pages of local newspapers as one of the prominent local artists. I also saw our dad, Weldon, chairing art committees and promoting the local art scene. I'm so proud of my mother as a person and an artist, but mostly as she was my mother. During her final illness, so many people talked to John and me and Chris and Dawn about what a remarkable person mom was. Their admiration for our mother has been seriously comforting. Trying to live up to the example that mom set has not always been an easy task. But I try to do that for my family and friends, and I will continue to do so remembering my mother's kindness, patience, grace, and humor. Chris, Spencer, and I loved mom dearly, and we are so very grateful for her presence in our lives. We will miss her very much. I'm now thinking that David took the smart route. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> on behalf of our family, I want to thank all of you for being here to help celebrate mom's life. <clears throat> the outpouring of affection and admiration for mom that we've heard and read about over the, the past week has been so comforting during a really difficult time. And thanks also to the many of you who made sure that you said those things directly to my mom before she left us. As she remarked to us a number of times how wonderful it is to just hear how many people love you while you're still here. In remembering my mother, we should certainly talk about her art, but, but we need to emphasize that that's not the whole story. It was her God-given gift, her talent, her career, and what many of you uh, knew most about her, probably. But there was so much more. However, it is a good place to start. I think what she strove for in her artwork was to help people see the beauty in the familiar. Most of what you find in her paintings are things that should be familiar to anyone who lives in this area. Flowers, fruit, vegetables, pastures, barns, forest streams, cows, snow-covered fields. But she had a talent for seeing the beauty 
in those ever-present and easily overlooked things. And then committing the shadow, the light, and the color to paper. Now notice that I said the talent wasn't just in the act of painting. It was first in the seeing. I think she wanted to help people see beauty the way she did. She hoped they'd recognize it in her paintings and then begin to look for it and find it in the familiar and run with that appreciation of beauty. And to the extent that she succeeded, the result was more than artwork. It was the gift of seeing with new eyes. I am moved emotionally by the natural beauty of this earth, and there is beauty in every place I have ever been. I have had people say it to me that there is no beauty in our area, and I have said to them, maybe not very politely, open your eyes. The rivers and oceans and small streams, the mountains and fields, weeds and flowers, trees and deserts, and objects that bring to mind warm feelings of family, serenity, and even spirituality. Let's talk about light. I wish everyone could see through my eyes. Light is the way God paints the world. An ordinary object can become beautiful simply because of the way the light strikes it. So that's, that's Karen Shelton, the artist. But I want to talk about my mom. I realize that some of you may have known my father, Weldon, better than you knew my mom. And that's okay. Dad was an extrovert. He was outgoing, always willing to, to stop and talk. He seemed to know everyone in Halifax County and every art patron in the Mid-Atlantic region. And he, he was very good at names, usually. Uh, but there, there was one time when Mom and Dad were driving back from Lynchburg, and somewhere in the northern part of the county, they, they passed a house that had a funeral sign on it and, and flowers. There was obvious evidence that someone had passed. And, and Dad said, I know these people. I can't think of their name at the moment, but I want to stop and, and offer uh, our sympathies. And mom said, I don't know who these people are. I'm going to sit in the car. And dad said, that's fine. I won't be more than five minutes. Just wait. <laughs> About 45 minutes later, dad came out to the car and mom said, well, who was it? And dad said, I didn't really know him. <laughs> so unless you were in the family, mom was harder to get to know. Her circle of friends was, was smaller, and she, she might could seem a little standoffish at first, but it was just that she was an introvert, and at first, uh, less self-assured than Dad. Famously, her sales technique began like this. Hi, you don't want to buy any Girl Scout cookies, do you? <laughs> so. Thankfully, Dad was her biggest fan and became the head of sales. I want to share a lesson that she taught me. Care for your church's ministers and their spouses. I saw Mom live this, beginning with Ray and Gail Pollard. And I'm not just referring to senior pastors. I'm talking about your ministers of music, your ministers of youth and education, what have you. Don't try to dictate what they should say and do. Allow them to grow which means accepting the failures along with the successes. Mom told me that ministers, they minister to our needs, but we easily overlook the fact that their needs are just as numerous. So offer them kindness and compassion. And you don't have to be your minister's best bud to offer them this. Although looking around the room, I see the fruit of those friendships for both my mom and I. Here's the main thing I want to say about mom. I think that the story of her life is one of courageous personal growth. 
She was intelligent, a voracious reader, and open to improvement. And in some cases, there was no choice but to grow. She publicly admitted that as a young adult, she struggled with depression and self-loathing. Self On top of what we would now call a, probably a genetic disposition to depression, she was unhappy with her weight and struggling with the role of being a new parent, which she said didn't come naturally or easily to her. And she could have gone on without any change until she completely broke. But she decided to act. So she moved to Durham for several months and joined the Duke Rice Diet Program. And she worked on her weight, but more importantly, she used that time and the resources that were there to learn to love and to value herself and coping skills to manage her emotional well-being. And that was just the beginning. It became a lifelong process. David was probably around two years old at this time, and that short absence from our home was extremely difficult on him. But mom knew that she couldn't take care of her family unless she first took care of herself. It was an act that I believe saved us all. What joy there is in climbing out of the pit of depression. It took therapy and prayer and the one little portion of scripture that finally penetrated my darkness. Love your neighbor as yourself. I realize that I cannot love my neighbor if I do not love myself. We are all made and loved by God, and it should be impossible to hate what God has made. Which brings us to the growth in her faith. When I was about eight or nine years old, I had a talk with mom about whether I should profess my faith in Jesus and be publicly baptized. And she was encouraging me, and I remember asking her why. And her reply was essentially, when you die, you're either going to heaven or hell, and I want you to go to heaven. Now, personally, I don't think that that's a good way to encourage faith in a child. <laughs> it doesn't promote a relationship with Jesus, and it doesn't encourage living a Christ-like life. Instead, it prompts action based on fear without any change of heart. But mom's faith grew a lot. The first evidence I saw was that she posted Proverbs 15.1 in our kitchen, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Her life became centered on a Christ-like love rather than on fear and the law. And it bears emphasizing what you just heard mom say. The greatest commandment is not love your neighbor. She grew to understand the wisdom of the entire commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love others well until you learn to love yourself as Christ loves you. Mom grew in other ways. She grew as an artist. She learned to be more self-assured. She didn't really get set in the old ways. She moved towards some more progressive and egalitarian ideas about who her neighbors were and why they deserved to be loved. So I think Mom's story is one of choosing personal growth. And growth isn't easy, so choosing it for her required courage. And I know this was important to her. This was an important theme because after she died this week, we found where she had handwritten the, some words copied from the Richard Paul Evans book, The Walk. The only real sign of life is growth, and growth requires pain. So choose life, so, choo so to choose life is to accept pain. Some people go to such great lengths to avoid pain that they give up on life. In spite of what happens to us, ultimately, we decide whether our lives are good or bad, ugly or beautiful. Some people in this world have stopped looking for beauty, then wonder why their lives are so ugly. Don't be like them. So let's have one more word from mom. Another lesson that took me a long time to understand is this. I always thought of myself as a body with a spirit inside. But I finally realized that I am an eternal spiritual being 
with a temporary body. Things more, make more sense to me now. Maybe you, like me, are moved by scripture about a heavenly host of angels singing and praising God. It must be a wonderful sound. Maybe I'll join that choir one day. We celebrate the beauty that she left behind. We celebrate and hope to emulate the courage to grow. And we celebrate that she has joined that heavenly choir. From the book of Romans we read, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are being, all being killed the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer
I am one of those <clears throat> ministers that Karen cared so much for. Um, she was always very gracious to me. I regret that she was no longer able to sing after I came here. Um, she had stopped singing some years before that. Your dad um, was the chairman of the personnel committee when I came here, when Bob and I came here. So it's all his fault. Just so you know. I've tried all week to think of the words to say today about Karen's tremendous talent as an artist and somehow be able to tie it in with something spiritual and absolutely nothing would come to me. That is until Thursday. I had already written something else that I was not exactly thrilled with. But Thursday, I read the article in the News and Record about Karen's artwork. And it, the title of the article was Seeing the World in a Different Light Through the Art of Karen Shelton. And it talks so much about Karen's use of light and shadows and color and how important these elements were in her artwork. Her son, John, was quoted in the article saying, because of her, I recognize the importance of light. We don't see objects directly. We see what the light reveals of objects, and beauty is found in the changing light. And then he added, the morning light may paint an object completely different than the evening light. Well, immediately, this passage of scripture came to my mind. It's not one that I have ever used at a funeral. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I think that Karen through her art, taught us a lot about light and life and how to be the light of the world and to let our light shine. In my living room, there are two of Karen's prints. One is called Spotlight on Flowers. It hangs over the mantle in my living room. The other one is called Weldon's Garden and it hangs on the wall behind Bob's recliner. One was a gift from Karen. The other one Bob gave me one year for Christmas. Both of them have the colors that I used in my living room some years ago when I redecorated, yellows and golds and reds. So I love having them in there because of those colors. I can tell you I am not a very good judge of visual arts. I know what I like when I see it, but I don't generally look at something and see details or how the light plays off the painting or as John said, what light reveals of objects. Karen would be cringing to hear me say that. I know some of you other artists in this room are cringing right now. But I am a student of music. I hear the details and the color in music more so than I see them in paintings. I hear individual instruments and voices and how they play off each other. That's just the way my brain is wired. But in preparation for this today, I sat down Thursday night in my living room right by myself and really studied these two prints that are in there. In one, the flowers in the foreground really seem much brighter than those in the background that can barely be seen in the shadows. In fact, in looking at it, I saw a flower in the background that I had actually never seen before. Its presence was so subtle. In the late evening and at night, when there isn't much light in that room, 
you can barely see anything in this print. But then the other print of Karen's, the colors are the same, the flowers are the same, but much more vibrant. It's like a bright sunlight shining on them and even through them. Even the background objects, though they aren't as sharp and as crisp as the flowers in the front, are lit up with light. You can almost feel the warmth of the sunlight in that print. Even in the darkness, the light shines in this print. It is my favorite of the two because it is brighter, but mainly because it reminds me of Weldon, because it's named Weldon's Garden, and Weldon loved his flowers. It is a reminder to me of a kind and gentle man who loved people, who loved doing for them, but it's also a reminder to me of the woman that loved him so much. I don't know about you, but I am not a fan of winter. I don't like the coldness, I don't like the darkness. In the winter months, I crave light, a lamp on the table, or a fire in a fireplace, or even a candle burning. I just need light. So often in winter when our um, daytime hours are dark and dreary, a beautiful sunlit day like today is a welcome sight to me. In the scripture that I read a few minutes ago, Jesus is speaking to us of light, not the kind that comes from us, the sun or a candle or a lamp that brings a glow of warmth. It is not even the kind of light that Karen incorporated in her artwork, the kind that revealed bits and pieces of objects that she painted. But rather this light that Jesus speaks of is the light that comes from within, the light that shines through individuals as he says to us, you are the light of the world. And as he says, let your light shine before others. However, there are some similarities in these kinds of lights. The kind of light that Jesus refers to brings clarity of our hearts. The kind of light that Karen used in her paintings also brings clarity to certain objects. The kind of light that Jesus is referring to illuminates our way. It is a light to our path. The kind of light that Karen used in her paintings also illuminates individual objects. Now you might think I'm stretching it here a bit, and I might be, but this is what I do know. The light of Jesus, alive in our hearts, is a gift to us. It is not one to be kept hidden or put under a bowl. It is not one to be kept selfishly for ourselves, but rather the light that Christ has gifted to us is to be shared with others. And he tells us that we are to put that light on a stand and to let that light shine before others. Sometimes we might think that light is small and it can't possibly make a difference. But I've heard it said that if the earth were entirely flat, you could see the light of one flickering candle even 30 miles away. So it doesn't really take much light for it to be seen. I think back to that print above my mantle with more shadows than light. There is just a very, very small amount of light on that one flower in the background but yet it's enough light for it to be seen. I know too with the loss of Karen, this family is experiencing darkness, not so much light right now. The past year or so have been very difficult for you as family as Karen's health has gradually declined. And especially in the past couple of weeks as we knew that the end of her life was near even though you might feel and experience only darkness right now, the good news is that the light of Christ still shines even in the darkness. Jenna Austin, 
one of my favorite people ever, wrote a very poignant tribute to Karen this week that she shared on Facebook. She's always referred to Karen as her fairy godmother. And in it, she talked of learning so much about art from Karen. At one point, she asked Karen how she was able to paint glass so flawlessly in her work, to which Karen replied, I don't paint the glass, but rather what glass shines through it. Isn't that exactly what Jesus is trying to say to us when he tells us that we are the light of the world and to let our light shine before men? We aren't to call attention to ourselves, but rather the light of Jesus shining through us points the way to him. Who we are is not because of what we do or the talents that we possess, but rather the light of Christ shining through us. And I'm convinced that that's what Karen did with her art. Allow the light of Christ to shine through her. I'm going to close with another quote by Jenna in her tribute to Karen. And she said, Karen's legacy will not live on in physical form, but rather what light shines through our memories of her. Karen understood the use of light in her artwork. She knew the properties of light and how they could bring out certain objects and colors even more brilliantly. Her life, too, was one that reflected the love of Christ as she was the light of the world and as she let her light shine, pointing the way to Christ. So may we, too, reflect the love of Christ as our lights shine for him. Let us pray. Holy God, as we remember Karen today and in the future, may we remember how much light she shed, not only through her artwork, but also through her personality, through her humor, through her laughter, through her love and caring for other people. She was the light of Christ, and the light of Christ shone through her. We pray that you would help us also to share that light, to be the light of Christ to others in this world, just to make this world a better place. We pray that your love, your kindness, your compassion, your hope, your peace, would continue to be with this family in the days ahead as they learn to live their lives without care and being physically present. May her memories give them comfort. May they try to live their lives the way that Karen did. These things we pray in your holy name. Amen. We're going to close by singing, God be with you till we meet again. The words, there are two verses and the words are on the back of your insert. Would you stand as we sing?